morning. On behalf of the British Chambers of Commerce and Chamber Customs, I want to welcome you to this third event in the Countdown to Change series of webinars that are counting down to the end of the transition period on the 31st of December 2020. We've had over a thousand registered today, so thank you all for joining us this morning. We are recording and will be running on Chatham House rules. Um, I'd also like to mention we will be observing a two minute silence at 11 o'clock. Today marks 50 days until that day we leave the EU. The United Kingdom borders will be under UK government control and we will no longer have the benefit of being in the European single market. Businesses will need to prepare for the impacts and changes that come about as a result. The full storms of previous no deal outcomes followed by the withdrawal agreement and transition period has resulted in many businesses reporting they have still a lot to do to be ready for change. Our session today will aim to point you in the direction of the practical actions that traders should consider against the backdrop of continued uncertainty regarding the outcome of the UK EU trade negotiations. Um, thank you to those of you who have completed our poll. If you haven't done so yet, you can do it. Um, you'll find the joining instructions, find the link on the joining instructions. For those firms who have completed it, completed it, they've said that almost two thirds have completed a risk assessment on the impacts of Brexit and around the same proportion have taken at least one of the eight steps that the government has advised them to take, such as registering for EORI numbers and to check whether you need customs declarations and assess the potential impact of existing contracts. Has to be said though, the people that have completed it so far are all trading in the EU. What we have found also is that of the non-trading, only about 4% of them have completed any of the eight steps. So they have a long way to go. I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Lord Agnew has given up his time. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Lord Agnew was appointed Secretary of State, uh, the Minister of State at the Cabinet Office and Her Majesty Treasury on the 14th of February this year. He was previously Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for the school system. He's also served as a lead non-exec board member for the Ministry of Justice and non-executive board member at the Department of Education, where he was chair of the department's academies board until 2015. As Minister of State for Efficiency and Transformation, his responsibilities include support of the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster and the Chief Secretary of the Treasury to deliver cross-government efficiency and public sector transformation improvements. We're also joined by Liam, obviously, and I'll introduce him a bit later. But firstly, Lord Agnew, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and you're going to speak to us now about your views on this. Great, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Sarah, for inviting me to join you today. The, the BCC's engagement has been of huge value to the government. Indeed, I think probably one of our most effective interlocutors over the last few months. And of course, we are now in the last uh, knockings of the transition period. So I'm very pleased to be able to talk to you and your members today. I'd like to start by saying that I absolutely understand the challenges that you are all facing and your frustration probably at the lack of clarity on the last elements of the detail of this, uh, of this transition. I have been in business myself for 40 years. I set my first business up when I was 18, I'm 59 now. So I absolutely do understand the, the position that many of you are in. I know that the dual impact of the transition and of the COVID pandemic has meant that businesses are very stretched and you're dealing with these very real issues on a daily basis. And recognizing this impact on businesses' ability to prepare, government is trying to be as flexible and pragmatic as we can as we, end the, as we come to the end of the transition. We're supporting as many businesses the pandemic by making a number of support schemes available, including loans, grants, tax deferrals. And we will continue to engage with businesses across sectors to help face these dual challenge in the preparation uh, to the end of the, of the transition. And, uh, and indeed, I'm very happy to take questions at the end of this to, uh, to get your feedback on things that you think we should still try to do in the last few weeks. I've been asked to give you an update on the negotiations, but of course, because of course that's the uh, the elephant in the room. 
Uh, I think the first thing just to restate uh, is that we will not be extending the transition period. I, I know that people have been marched up the hill at least twice in the last 18 months, and there is a hope that that might happen again. But I, the analogy I use really is it's, uh, we're due to go in for a hip transplant. We're, we're, we want to put it off because it's painful, and we know that recovering will be painful. But the reality is that we, we need to get on with this now. And, and just and, and get it get it behind us. The, the majority of the actions businesses and others need to take are not dependent on whether we get an FTA or not, a free trade agreement or not. I think that's a very important point that I'd be most anxious that the BCC keep reminding all of you that the, the big change is not the FTA, it's the leaving of the customs union. And that, that is really the most important element for all of you just to take on board. Certainly a negotiated outcome remains our absolute preference, but uh, whatever agreement we do reach, we will be leaving the customs union on the 31st of December. We are it's still in intensive talks and those are carrying on, they've been extended. There are clearly some significant gaps between us, uh, but we are doing all we can to bridge that. We remain clear that the best and most established means of regulating a relationship between the two countries is on a basis of a free trade agreement. The EU have now recognized our overwhelming desire to be regarded as a sovereign state and that the negotiations should be with that in mind. Since October, the European Council, Lord Frost and Mr. Barnier have agreed to intensify the negotiations and both sides have jointly agreed a set of principles for handling this intensification. We, we, are, we need to examine the legal text, understand the value of what's on the table and ensure that it does not cross the UK's fundamental principles. We approach this intensified process with a determination to get a deal if there's one possible and indeed the one offered originally, which is essentially a Canada type deal is what we are looking for, nothing really uh, different to that. Uh, but uh, regardless of that, we will be leaving at the end of this year. So it's essential for UK businesses, hauliers and travelers to prepare for the end of this transition period as the change is coming. Currently, traders only need to complete customs declarations when importing or exporting goods outside of the EU, but from the 21st of January 2021, the same process will be needed for the EU, coming through in stages with full import controls from the 1st of January and then uh, and then exports, uh, uh, sorry, uh, with full import controls on controlled goods needed for the 1st of January and 1st of July on non-controlled goods. Export and safety and security declarations will also be needed on all exports from the 1st of January. Traders must be ready for this change. Traders who currently trade outside the EU will have knowledge of these declarations and essentially you will take your knowledge and experience and infrastructure that you use for the rest of the world transactions into the EU. However, there are many traders and particularly those that uh, who, who in particular just trade with the EU and not the rest of the world and so will not be familiar with these differences. In practice, most traders will need an intermediary to act on their behalf to make these declarations. And I would urge if there's one thing you take from me today on this call is if you don't already have uh, booked up with an intermediary that you get on and secure one literally in the next few days. If you need more guidance on this, do have a look at gov.uk to find out more information. And one of the things I'm always interested to hear from people, the, what I would call real people, such as yourselves in business, if you think the guidance is unclear in any way, then photograph it or cut and paste it and send it through to us, telling us why it is ambiguous and how it could be improved. Another key step that businesses and traders need to do is to ensure they have their EORI number, which is uh, the, the key number with HMRC. We do have 270,000 businesses with their EORI number, so I do think the vast majority have it, but it also need, you need to then uh, to weaponize it, essentially. If you are going to need to move goods in and out of Northern Ireland, then there is the trader support service that we have created to provide the support for traders involved in that. 
In terms of HMRC readiness, the, uh, or I beg pardon, the government's readiness, HMRC, DEFRA and the government are working closely with businesses and traders and intermediaries to ensure that we are moving towards having the most effective border. HMRC is ensuring that its IT systems, guidance and support for traders are in place. And from January 21, this is limited to the control imports and to all exports. DEFRA is also working directly with ports and airports to prepare the necessary infrastructure, staff and IT systems for the GB border. In terms of DEFRA's IT systems, the import and export systems, IPA, FS, and EHCO, ECHO, will be ready to manage both import and export of commodities from and into the EU and non-EU countries before the end of the transition period. DEFRA is fully engaged in preparations for a wide range of potential scenarios that include the introduction of the new check and HGV service, which will provide upstream support to ensure exporters are border ready. As the BCC has rightly raised, it's essential that the government provides clear guidance to businesses so they are prepared for these changes. <clears throat> and we are committed to continually reviewing and improving this information, as I, I mentioned a moment ago. We have created a tracker tool on gov.uk for businesses to understand the specific actions required for them. And again, feedback from you as to how effective that tracker tool is, is important because if we can improve it, we, we will do everything possible to do that. We are launching a major national communications campaign, indeed running since July. The latest phase of this public information campaign emphasizes the increased urgency to prepare for the end of the transition period. With the simple strap line, time is running out. We've launched the free to use trader support service. This is backed by 200 million pounds of UK government funding. This will provide the support and guidance to businesses of all sizes, moving goods, under the Northern Irish Protocol. We've provided £84 million in grants for customs intermediaries to support them in recruitment, training and supplying IT to boost their capacity. But I'm very keen to hear more of what you think the government should be doing in the remaining weeks before the end of the transition. Thank you, Sarah. So very happy to take questions. Lovely. Thank you so much, Lord Agnew. Um, that's a really good introduction and obviously as you say you're you're here to answer questions more than to than to deliver um to us so the whole point of today is learning and moving on and making sure we do get ready for what's coming on to us um the first question i've got for you um is the treasury committee and the national audit office have raised significant concerns about hmrc's systems readiness what reassurances can you give traders that these systems will be ready and what is plan b yeah, well, it's, uh, it is a perfectly legitimate criticism query to be raising of, of the readiness of these systems because they are being run down to the wire. I am the, the Minister for HMRC Border Readiness, and so I am over this like a, a cheap suit in simple parlance. I, I believe they will be ready, but the, the margin for error is limited. So for the, 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 one of the systems won't have its final upgrades until December, which does leave very little time for error correction and so on. But broadly speaking, I believe that we are, we are okay. The, the most important system, Chief, uh, is one that any of you who export to the rest of the world know already. That has been dramatically upgraded for it, for the, uh, the extra volume of transactions. Uh, the other key systems, GVMS, are at a good state of, of, uh, of readiness and indeed uh, coming out of a, a seminar not unlike this one actually a few weeks ago, one of the ports asked us to bring a, an enhancement to the GVMS to allow barcode, read, bar, barcode reading of, uh, of, of, um, of GVMS uh, registration numbers and we've been able now to do that, which will be available for, for carriers who want to integrate into it. But, uh, and I just cite that as an example of, of us trying to listen to traders when they bring forward credible uh, challenges to us uh, so that we, that we do try to listen and where we can do something about it, I'm certainly pushing very hard. So I, I don't want to paint a an excessively uh, 
a Panglossian picture of readiness of the systems, but I think we are in a, a reasonably good place. Okay, thank you. Um, I also should have pointed out that um, Lord Agnew is joined by a team from his cabinet office and from DEFRA. So um, if necessary, they will come in and answer any detailed questions as well on their particular area of expertise. So any questions you have, please keep adding them to the, the chat. Okay, apologies, my link is really quite iffy. So just give me a second while I come up with the next question. Can I maybe jump in then, Sarah? Yeah, please do, because I'm sorry, I'm just, I've just yeah, gone really um, wavy. Uh, something else we need some uh, infrastructure help on, I think uh, we all yes, know please. that parts of the UK. Um, so uh, we've got a question, Lord Agnew, from uh, Neil Tomlinson from a company called Aquapax. And he says, we're a UK registered company with two European production sites. They currently only declare our UK address on all consumer facing packages despite selling the same products in the UK, Europe and Middle East. Are we obliged to include a European address going forward? What's the minimum legal requirement and what's the drop dead date for this change? Um, so fairly complex question there, but not untypical of what we hear from companies with multiple sites who are selling to multiple countries. Yeah, well, that is a technical question. I, I'm afraid I don't have the knowledge. I don't know if there are officials on the line from HMRC who can answer it. But if we don't have them, then if you could send me Neil's contact details, I'll make sure that we get a, a written response to him as soon as possible. But just see if we've got any HMRC colleagues who can answer it. Is there anybody on the line? Uh, I think they've left me swinging well, perhaps, on that one. Perhaps then I'll bring you a more succinct question. William Bullimore says, good morning, Lord Agnew. Could you outline the key aspects of a Canada-type deal? Yeah, I think the, 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 the important aspects of the Canada deal are simply a, a free trade agreement on, on a large number of items. I, I, I can't remember the exact number of tariff lines, but I think there's something in the order of 15,000 across you know, every product that is in, the, uh, in the, the whole canon of physical trade. And so the idea with the, ca the Canada deal is to eliminate as many of those tariffs as possible. And, and that is what we believe is the sensible thing to happen. Uh, we already start with almost perfect equivalence in all of our trading standards between the two, the two blocks, the UK and the EU. And so it is certainly the pragmatic solution but uh, unfortunately, uh, trade negotiations are more than about what simple businessmen like somebody like me and probably like um, our questioner are asking. Uh, there are more, more complicated forces at play, but that is essentially what a Canada deal is. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Right, I'm back, Liam, thank you. Um, I've got a more general question here from Callum about our EU, EU colleagues. Is there similar information preparations for our EU colleagues is a company from Italy, for example, being told how to prepare for trading with the UK? Yes, we're certainly, we're certainly communicating across the EU uh, and indeed we've produced uh, uh, guidance in, in multiple languages. I think we've just produced uh, something in the last week or two for hauliers in a number of different languages. So, so we are absolutely reaching out to, to the whole of the EU to, uh, to make sure that, that they are aware of the changes as well. Yeah, well, also our, our various BCC um, offices across Europe and internationally are supporting their businesses locally as well with as much information as they can gather for them. Um, going into the agri-food sector, Colin Moore has a question, particularly um, for SMEs for whom trade in the EU single market has been key. He says the most significant long-term hurdle to viability of exports is not tariffs and duties, but non-tariff barriers such as SPS checks. How is UK government seeking to maintain as far as possible frictionless trade with the EU SM, the minimisation of non-tariff barriers and to enable continued access for SMEs, especially those using the pallet and parcel grouping networks? So I think I might defer to DEFRA colleagues for more detail on that, but, but that is essentially the essence of, of, of what we want in a free trade agreement to, to establish the, the, as little friction as possible. But I'll, I'll pass to DEFRA colleagues if they can provide any more any granularity on that. Thank you, 
they've all gone quiet. Right, uh, Ruth, hello. Hi. Hi. Oh, sorry, I've just seen Ian's popped up in my team as well. Ian, would you like to take that one? Yes. Um, we are looking to work with the EU to minimise SPS checks, as Lord Agnew has already suggested, in terms of as part of an FTA, and if an FTA isn't achievable, to have reciprocal arrangements in place. That's ongoing, um, and we've already got some reciprocal arrangements, but not in all places. However, it is clear that the EU will impose some SPS checks on imports into the EU in accordance with international uh, agreements that are in place. So unless a, an FTA is put in place that covers that, um, there will be SPS checks at some level, and the level will vary depending on the type of good involved. Okay, thank you. Tim. Uh, moving on away from the EU trade deal, there's obviously a lot of talk about EU trade deals, but um, what what is now happening with the UAE trade deal? Are negotiations going on, or do you think that we have not have a US deal in place? Well, I, I think, uh, I mean, the, the negotiations will absolutely continue, and I think it was it was quite a, a, a symbolically positive thing that the first European leader that the president-elect spoke to is our own prime minister. And so I, I remain optimistic that, the, that we will have a trade deal with America in the US in due course, but I think we mustn't understate the complexity of it. And, and that's probably why the EU never managed to get a trade deal with the, uh, with the US. So, so we, we, I, I think it would be wrong to suggest that this is imminent. Uh, but I think we, we proved that we can do one with, a, with the next biggest economy, Japan, which I think is great progress. And obviously, we're in intensive discussions with other, others of these large economies. So it's an absolute priority for us, and, and we will carry on with that. COVID, of course, has made life more complicated for every, everyone. And these sort of deals, as, as business people on the line will understand, it, it, that human interaction, the building of trust with people, it's extraordinarily difficult to do that on a, on a rather disembodied Zoom type uh, negotiation. So, so I, I think that will have delayed things, but we, it, it's a top priority. Okay, thank you. And then moving on to the Northern Ireland, um, Republic of Ireland relationship. Um, what do you expect for the future of that relationship with the UK mainland? Well, the North, Northern Irish Protocol is an extremely complex uh, attempt to bridge all of the multiple uh, uh, demands of maintaining the Good Friday Agreement, keeping a, a minimal border between North and South, and keeping Northern Ireland as very much part of the United Kingdom. So it is an extraordinarily difficult balance, that balancing act for all of those things to occur. But we are doing the best we can to deliver that. I'm personally, in the, in the longer term, pretty optimistic because I think technology will, as chat, uh, will deal with a lot of the kind of emotional problems and worries people have about checks at borders and so on. So, uh, for example, there is a company, uh, I don't mind name checking it because I think it is such a remarkable piece of technology called P2D, which essentially provides uh, barcoding down to the to an individual apple in a lorry to show the the origin of that apple, where the journey that the apple has been on, whether if it came from Morocco or Spain, the day it was loaded, where the lorry stopped, uh, and so that that sort of thing deals with the rules of origin, which are very much at the forefront of the EU's concerns. And then I was sent another piece of technology only a week ago, which I have sent through into HMRC, which is able to pick up drugs and all sorts of other unsavory things simply through uh, some form of science. I can't remember what it is, but it's being used on the Mexican border, for example. And again, it means that, that, that any kind of stoppage, stopping of vehicles and so on can be narrowed down to the tiniest level of, of, of risk. We, know, we can take risk uh, from very good intelligence. And I, I think this will be an increasing development over the next three or four years, which is why I, I'm hopeful that the relationship will, will, um, will, will become much more stable. I think it's the uncertainty that, that, that has caused so much of the, of the difficulty over the last couple of years, but gradually I think this things will settle down. 
Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Uncertainty is is the enemy of business, and that's what we've been experiencing. So anything that, that um, builds towards more certain um, future is, is a benefit to all of us, isn't it? Um, thank you so much, Lord Agnew. Um, we've, we've dotted you around rather a lot. Thank you for dealing with our, our varied questions. And thank you so much for joining us this morning. No problem. Can I just finish by asking Liam a question? Because, I, because when I met him a few weeks ago, he told me what you were doing on your, your own intermediary service. I just wanted to hear how you were getting on with that, Liam. How, how many of your customers, your members have signed up? Uh, what sort of capacity you have left to take on any new customers? Thank, thank you uh, for, for everything today, Lord Agnew. Uh, um, uh, on uh, Chamber Customs of Service, uh, over the last, uh, I would say, uh, four weeks, the number of customers signing up to our services increased dramatically. Some uh, 250 new customers have come to us uh, during that period of time. Um, in terms of capacity, in some parts of the country, we are uh, reaching capacity levels and other parts we have capacity. The advantage of operating at 40 different locations is we have resilience in the system. So we still have some capacity left, um, but I suspect that we may have to close the close the uh, the door on new contracts before the year end, if I'm being candid about it. Now, yep. that, that, that means, of course, that we need to train more people. Uh, you would be reasonable in saying that that's what we need to do. So, um, but, but training more people, we have 200 people that we've, uh, uh, that we've deployed on this project. There's a huge investment for traders. Uh, we've been supported by the HMRC grant scheme. Um, and, uh, and, and I've no doubt that we will be calling on that uh, some more. But the, we have capacity. We're signing up a lot. And businesses are moving now uh, uh, in a way that we were seeing... Uh, um, fairly sluggish approach previously. Good. Well, I just sort of wanted to finish on a last appeal, a plug for the, the BCC service. And for any of you on the call today who haven't engaged with an intermediary to grab the last bit of capacity that Liam has got available, that would be my plea to you. Because if I have a single big worry, that is my biggest single worry, actually, that, that traders have not engaged and signed up with intermediaries yet. And it's uh, it's a process that it's it's not just you know logging on and buying uh, buying a shirt from Amazon. You, you, you're going to need to interact in some detail with the intermediary. And so really, if you don't get on and do it in the next week or so, allowing for Christmas, you just won't have time to be sufficiently embedded with the intermediary for the go live date in January. So if I could just leave with that plea and a pump and a pump for the BCC, sign up with their service if you haven't already. But thank you very much, all of you, for letting me join you today. Thank you, Lord. Thank, thank you. you very much. OK, right. That's um, that was fantastic. Really good to see his input. Now we're, we're moving on to Liam's segment. I'm sure all of you know Liam, but if you don't, he is <laughs> he is our expert. He's the director of trade facilitation here at the BCC. Um, he's get very kept very busy engaging cross government on future trade policy and the impacts of Brexit on future trade. He represents the chamber network on a number of government working groups. Is a member of the HMRC's joint customs consultation committee is on the International Chambers Committee, Technical Committee of Origin. More recently, he has also led the development of a new customs declaration service that will be delivered through our chamber network, Chamber Customs. Chamber Customs um, has been set up by us early in the aftermath of the Brexit refer referendum vote. It became very apparent to the BCC that one of the impacts of leaving the single market would be that trades would be required to make many, many more import and export declarations. Work by the National Audit Office revealed that the scale of the increase would be an eye-watering 220 million declarations at a recurring cost of 7 billion to businesses. The logistics industry suggested, and Michael Gove confirmed, that 50,000 additional customs agents would need to be hired and trained. Chamber Customs is the BCC's response to this call. Now based in over 40 locations across the UK with over 150 trained agents, Chamber Customs will offer an additional capacity of 500,000 from the 1st of January 2021. So welcome, Liam. Thank you for joining us today. And I will hand over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. And um, uh, thank you to uh, everyone who has uh, 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 asked questions so far. There are over 100 questions in the uh, Q&A. 
Um, some of those we've been able, as you know, to pose to Lord Agnew. Others, uh, I can promise you that we will uh, share with everyone. We will also share with the uh, uh, Cabinet Office uh, and endeavour to get responses directly from them for you if we don't cover some of those subjects uh, in the next uh, 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 tw 25 minutes or so uh, up to um, 10.59, when, as you know, we will um, uh, move to uh, a two-minute silence. We will reconvene again after that uh, two-minute silence um, uh, and take uh, uh, your questions and, and deal with as many of those on the chat box as, as we can, if you're able to join us uh, on, on, that, uh, on that, that, uh, that session. Anywho, uh, I'm going to move to share my, my screen now. Um, this is the bit where, uh, of course, uh, I'm never really uh, certain whether I am actually sharing uh, the right bit. I think I am. Uh, if somebody can just confirm that uh, I'm showing Chamber Customs. Is that what people are seeing, Sarah? Sorry, I lost my unmute button. Yes, we can see it. Thank you. It's very clear. Okay, oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm always a bit nervous. Um, so um, the, the next 20 minutes or so is going to be a roller coaster ride through um, uh, my presentation. Uh, when I'm, I'm going to really deal with three matters. Um, I've confined them into uh, things we still don't know, um, things you need to know, uh, and things you need to do now. And hopefully you'll, you'll find uh, those three elements fairly succinct, and particularly the things you need to do now element uh, uh, helpful in planning for uh, your business uh, over the next 50 days as of course time is running out. And um, I should say that whilst Lord Agnew presents the government's position, um, I'm gonna present my view of the government's position and actually where I think we are on a number of, of, of areas. So starting then with the things that we, that we still don't know. Well, the big thing that was alluded to on the question, uh, the first question to Lord Agnew is this big national audit office report. It's on gov.uk, it's worth uh, looking at if you uh, haven't already, uh, but it, it can be best described, I think, as a fairly scaling comment on the readiness of government and government systems for the end of the transition period. Um, the, uh, the, the headlines are 270 million customs declarations to be uh, 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 carried out each year um, from 1st of January against a current 55 million, a massive increase. And it's been alluded to the challenge of uh, the intermediary market uh, not having sufficient capacity. Uh, the 40 to 70% is the proportion of laden lorries traveling to the EU that will not be ready for EU customs requirements under the government's uh, most reasonable worst case scenario. Um, that, that uh, of course, indicates that there could be blockades at the, uh, at the ports. And uh, I know there are a number of questions about the impact that has in supply chains. Uh, I know there's one in there about the impact from Northern Ireland to uh, GB. Um, and, and of course, the government has announced a massive £1.41 billion pounds of funding uh, to support um, the readiness programme. But actually, the NEO would say that that, that may be coming uh, too late uh, to be ready for uh, the, the cliff edge of 31 December. Uh, deal or no deal, uh, I think it's, it's fair to say, deal or no deal, those infrastructure issues remain, in particular around IT systems. Um, and we've, uh, you know, we, I, I, I you know, meet regularly with HMRC uh, and they are implementing a range of IT systems that some of which have to interact with each other, which only increases the complexity. Uh, but it's interesting that the Border and Protocol Delivery Group in March 2020 uh, reported that eight of the nine key elements of the government and border industry readiness that it was monitoring were at significant risk of, of not being delivered by 1 January 21. The most recent report from NEO uh, only uh, a, a, a few days ago um, says that actually those are still, uh, that all of those issues remain IT systems, infrastructure, data, custom agency capacity and trader and haulier readiness. So there is a big gap in, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, the systems readiness and the infrastructure readiness and the haulier readiness uh, that will impact on traders. And if you uh, lay over the top of that, that we only have uh, 50 days to go and that some of those systems have not yet been made available to traders and intermediaries, then those traders and intermediaries have not yet been able to test, to debug, 
uh, and also to learn and train their people on how to use, use uh, those systems. So that's one of the big things we don't know is, are the systems going to be ready? And um, as was asked by more than one person in the Q&A, what is plan B? We didn't actually get an answer to that um, uh, from, uh, from Lord Bagnew on the call. Um, so uh, what else? Uh, we, we, you know, he talked about the desire for a negotiated outcome from the government side, but the big question is, you know, will there be a deal or uh, is there not going to be a deal? Um, the, the good news, I guess, is that the both sides they continue to talk. Um, we don't know yet if we'll have a deal uh, uh, as an outcome. Um, and the issues still at stake seem still to be around uh, fisheries policy and the uh, uh, arrangement between uh, both sides in allocating uh, quotas and how frequently those uh, things should happen. Uh, on issues around state aid and the UK's willingness to, to state its position, its future position on uh, dealing with state aid and also dispute re resolution. Where will dispute resolution happen? Is it the uh, European Court of Justice or through some other uh, means on both sides? They seem still to be issues. And then, um, you know, th that is uh, not only to, to protect the EU's uh, uh, key principles of, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the free movement of uh, people and goods and so on and labour, uh, but, but actually uh, about protecting the Northern Ireland Protocol, something that has been, uh, was hard fought, hard won, and uh, it really is about protecting the peace of Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, a, a, a sort of uh, uh, flying the ointment with that, of course, was the introduction of the UK Internal Market Bill, which even the, uh, the president-elect in the United States has, uh, has been heard to comment that he, he suggests that it should not exist, it should be dropped and, and taken out of uh, the picture. Uh, and uh, if the UK is to get a deal with the uh, European Union, um, it shouldn't compromise that possibility through the UK internal market bill. Of course, the government would say that it needs to protect uh, circumstances of no deal. So the internal market bill uh, may be, um, uh, at best, it may be a negotiating tactic and leverage for uh, the desired um, uh, negotiated outcome that Lord Agnew referred to. And one of the things I would uh, point to is behaviours, and I would say look out for uh, certain kind of behaviours, so that language that's being used. More recently, we've seen uh, the language has been more about intensifying talks. It's been about uh, uh, negotiations continuing, um, that, that there are some tough things that need to be dealt with on both sides that have still not been addressed. Um, and, and also the false dawns. We've had a number in the past, and we've had less of those in the last couple of weeks, which is good. Um, so no one is talking about those deadlines of uh, the European Union uh, need to see uh, met in order that they can get these any deal through the respective parliaments and ratified. Um, there's much, uh, things have been much more uh, calm um, and the pace and frequency of meetings has increased that intensifying of discussions has to be, I think we, we have to view that positively. Um, but what we we need to see, obviously, on both sides is compromise on the matters that are the sticking points. You know, th this is uh, likely to be a, a, a negotiation that goes to, to the wire. Um, uh, at the, I, I recall back uh, just after the Brexit referendum vote um, in a presentation I made, I, I, I referred to the Treaty of Rome, which also incidentally went right to the wire um, and, and where there were, uh, there was a posed photograph where uh, uh, country leaders are seen to, to, to be signing uh, the Treaty of Rome. In fact, they signed blank pieces of paper as a matter of intent because the final text had, had yet to be decided. I would not be surprised if we uh, uh, reach the 31st of December. We, this goes right to the wire. And what comes out of it is a, an agreement to agree on something in the future uh, that enables some easements to take place and some of the pressure to be taken off of border uh, uh, processes uh, on both on both sides. You know, we've we've seen a lot. We've, we're exposed to what is a political negotiation taking place that has included lots of uh, fear from both sides about the outcome of not uh, reaching an agreement 
there's been a huge amount of rhetoric, but I am a glass half full, half full kind of person. So my hope is that pragmatism will prevail at the end of the day, and actually we will end up with some kind of uh, negotiated outcome. But please don't be surprised if that doesn't happen until uh, after Christmas or just before. Um, I, I think we, we need to be hearing mood music that, that looks like something is possible uh, right throughout the, the next uh, um, uh, 30 to 40 days that will give us hope that something will happen uh, by the end of the transition period. So uh, now we move into things you need to know. Um, you need to know what the impact is of a no deal. Uh, the big impact is around 220 million more customs declarations, the need for export health certificates and uh, uh, sanitary and phytosanitary checks, and a whole range of other non-tariff barriers. Uh, you know, there are some 27 or 28 agencies at, at our border uh, and a similar number at other borders. The, the agencies are looking at a range of things that in, in and of themselves can introduce non-tariff barriers, but there are also the other non-tariff barriers related to the um, you know, standards and regulation and the like that we operate in respective countries that can be uh, eroded somewhat by a trade deal. WTO rules would apply uh, in respect of uh, goods uh, uh, to and from the EU and tariffs would be payable on some goods. It's reasonable to say though that many uh, categories of goods don't attract any uh, tariff at all, but those that do tend to be at the, uh, you know, at the, at the higher end if you think of uh, agri products like beef and, uh, and, and, and meat carcasses and the like. There would be a loss of accumulation in relation to rules of origin that we currently benefit from, um, not only with the EU, but also in respect of accumulation of origin with, uh, of EU content, uh, as well as that, uh, that, that comes from other countries that have trade agreements with the EU. And of course, there would be the loss of some continuity trade deals, and I'll go into some detail on that in a moment. Um, what's the impact of an EU-UK free trade agreement or some kind of agreement? Well, actually, we still have 220 million more customs declarations, a point that Lord Nagy was, was, was pressing at the end of, of, of his session there. Um, we will still have those export health certificates and sanitary and phytosanitary techs taking place uh, at our borders. Um, but we would have tariff-free tariff trade for most goods um, uh, and uh, the, the, we would expect that it would be very few goods that would attract a tariff rate quota in a deal with the European Union, but that would depend on the depth and breadth of, of the deal. Uh, we would expect that that, that would in food, uh, include full accumulation of origin, so the ability to count content from EU production into UK production for, uh, for uh, certifying origin uh, of goods going to other markets. And we would have uh, um, the continuity deals that are already signed and potentially some new trade deals because, as I'll come on and point out later, there are some countries that are waiting to see what happens with the UK and EU trade deal before signing up a new trade deal with the UK uh, bilaterally. And, and there would be also clearly a very big one in terms of alignment of uh, regulations and standards for the most in the immediate future, although there could be some divergence uh, later. Um, so what about those free trade, deals, trade, free trade agreements? Well, they typically cover a, range, cover a range of areas, and I'll focus on, on four here, security, policy, uh, politics and prosperity, the building of trust and aid, as well as trade, tend to be features of, of those uh, uh, free trade agreements. And the reason they're good for traders is principally because they provide preferential tariffs, uh, generally, that means that the tariffs on goods moving across a border attract zero tariff. Uh, and, and, and in effect, that makes uh, the goods coming from the UK more competitive going into those countries because uh, we don't pay tariffs. We have a competitive, a competitive advantage in those that, that do. Uh, they also make borders easier because we're recognised as train, tra trading partners. And also, it's not only the goods uh, that move across those borders that the, the ease, actually, it's the movement of people as well. Typically, uh, some trade agreements will also could include um, uh, uh, arrangements in terms of workforce moving around uh, between countries uh, and also the, the, uh, the issuance of uh, work, work visas and the like. And then big important uh, aspect of trade agreements is data and money. 
Um, so, you know, one of the outstanding issues with the EU, of course, is, is, is the matter re matters relating to the movement of data uh, between the UK and the EU and back again, where companies may have very integrated uh, systems and the repatriation of funds and money. So there can be circumstances where uh, the amount of cash withdrawn from a country can be limited for those that don't have trade agreements uh, and more open for those uh, that do. And that affects uh, inward investment as well as uh, just the repatriation of profits and the like. Um, so on trade agreements already done, there are 40 countries with whom the UK has reached agreement, although not all of these agreements have been uh, have been through Parliament, uh, the, the expectation is that they would be applied in principle uh, from the 1st of, of January. You'll see Japan in there, one of the more recent uh, agreements uh, that have been made, um, uh, 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 and uh, as well as the Ukraine, uh, which came uh, thereafter. So these are agreements in principle uh, for 48 countries. What does that mean in terms of trade? Well, it's around £125 billion of trade. You may see comment from the government saying, re referring to 144 billion. Um, my 125 billion relates to trade uh, with those countries in 2019. The 144 relates to uh, future trade prospects. So they are two different uh, sources of data. That leaves around 19 countries and 40 billion pounds of, of trade uh, where uh, we don't yet have continuity agreements in place. And I'll give you detail on who those, where those countries are uh, just uh, on the next slide. But it does, the big show in town has to be the EU 27 uh, countries where we have 300 billion pounds worth of trade, uh, of export trade from the UK and 43% of UK exports going to those 27 countries. And 51% of our imports come from those 27 countries, 372 billions, uh, a billion pounds worth of, of goods. Of course, um, some would say, well, that's great. We have a balance of 72 billion. But I always remind people at that point, that actually, some of that uh, 372 billion is in the form of component parts that are made into finished goods that are then exported and become part of the 300 billion pounds of UK exports. So we're reliant on uh, components uh, uh, as, as well. Um, so yet to be done, uh, um, uh, if anyone was on the previous uh, uh, webinar for 75 days to go. Uh, those that are in green and yellow were previously in green. I'm saying now that actually time is running out for those trade deals to be to be done. So red is uh, rollover agreements with countries that are just not likely to be done this year or have any prospect of being done anytime soon because really negotiations are not going well and may not even have kicked off. Uh, those in amber on the left hand side are those that are um, that are progressing in terms of negotiation, but but will not be done uh, by the end of December 2020, but may have a chance in 2021. Some rely on the uh, the, the trade agreement with the uh, European Union. Mexico would be an example of that. Mexico, very advanced negotiations with the UK, but reluctant to, uh, to sign a bilateral agreement until they see uh, uh, what happens with the EU. Uh, because of, of the way their, their uh, uh, supply chains are integrated, particularly around the motor car industry. Um, and then those at the bottom, Vietnam, Canada, uh, Egypt, North Macedonia and Turkey. And whilst negotiations are progressing, uh, they very much rely on uh, an EU deal being done. And they're not looking like they're going to progress to being signed off um, before the end of the year. Certainly won't make it through Parliament in time. We're running out of parliamentary time. Um, they could be reached as agreements in principle. I would say Egypt is probably high on that list. Canada probably is up on that list. Um, uh, but the rest are relying on uh, the arrangements with the EU. Second block is the CPTPP, the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's a mouthful. A living countries. Um, uh, we, we, we will reach or uh, we, we expect to reach agreement with a number of those countries um, uh, over the next six to 12 months as part of our move to accede to the CPTPP. And you can see in the green and amber uh, um, uh, those that, that apply there. And also Australia and New Zealand, where we don't currently have a trade agreement, but there is a likelihood that we'll reach one in the months ahead. Although again, I'm saying unlikely to happen before the end of this year. Um, 
Moving on to uh, uh, more on free trade, the general system of preference, generalized system of preference, GSP, and there's three different kind of GSP categories, standard, GSP plus, and everything but arms arrangements. It was announced yesterday that the UK will apply the, uh, the, the rollover, if you like, the GSP arrangements that have applied uh, as part of the European Union. This is a list of the countries, uh, 15 uh, GSP, 8 GSP plus, and 48 uh, every, everything but arms. So another 71 uh, countries in, included uh, uh, to add to the, the 48 that I already mentioned. So that gives 119 countries that we would have some kind of trading arrangement. But remember, for GSP countries, typically there's a, a we, we import uh, 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 more than we export, and we're importing uh, uh, very often uh, uh, what we call low-value goods. So they're low-cost goods to the consumer in the UK, and they help consumer prices to remain to remain low. I highlight in yellow uh, the six uh, countries of the East Africa uh, Trade Partnership uh, because we have just recently uh, reached an agreement with Kenya. In Africa, that's seen as being uh, maybe not a good thing for the East Africa uh, Trade Partnership, with the, some of the other countries being feeling a bit sore that, that Kenya has gone out on its own and signing an agreement with uh, the UK. It'll either bring the other countries in uh, or it'll leave them uh, out, but not either way, they still benefit from the everything but arms uh, GSP at uh, trade terms, which in effect lowers, lowers trade uh, import tariffs to zero. Um, Lord Agnew's talked about this, I'm not going to dwell on it, but there is a big gap. Um, uh, the, uh, they still uh, continue to report customs intermediate capacity as red rated risk for both January and July. So even across the period of uh, implementing uh, staged uh, declarations. Um, the uh, Foreign Protocol, Protocol Delivery Group and National Audit Office are saying there's still risk. So yeah, capacity is limited. So my, I urge you that are on this call to try and secure your capacity uh, to ensure that you can continue trading before the, the year end. Things you need to know now, and I'm in my last four minutes, um, there's 20 questions that are on here. I'm not going to dwell on them. Um, they're in the presentation pack you will receive after this uh, event, uh, but there are 20 questions in there that I'm suggesting that you as businesses should be asking of yourselves, including uh, what is my URI number? I, I think you will all know that now, but the question, do I need an XI uh, URI number for Northern Ireland trade, maybe one that you don't know, you have up until the 23rd of September if you sign up to the Northern Ireland Trader Support Service and you do that now, they will automatically uh, um, uh, auto enroll you to an XI EORI number for Northern Ireland trade um, if you already have an EORI number um, uh, for your company for the UK trade. Um, so um, you can't sign up for the Trader Support Service without an EORI number. So once you do that, that will be an auto enrollment and save you some time. And then the questions of will I use staged or full EU import controls from 1st of January? That's a decision point to make. Uh, and you should examine uh, why you would or why you wouldn't. And then a couple of things at five and six on cash flow, which are really important. How do you set up a, a postponed VAT accounting? You really want to do that if you pay VAT on the importation of goods from anywhere in the, in, in the world, because you can delay paying, paying uh, 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 the VAT or the import VAT until your next VAT return. Uh, really useful for cash flow and a very uh, useful uh, move that we, we, we lobbied for uh, um, for some time. Uh, and then duty deferment account, again, one that we lobbied on for guarantee free duty deferment accounts been available since a week past Friday on gov.uk. Uh, and I would urge you to apply for a guarantee free duty deferment account with a value of £10,000 per month minimum. Um, it doesn't cost you anything but time to make the application, but may help you substantially in terms of cash flow. So that's the, the 20 questions for you to review in, at, your, at your leisure. Um, how can we help? Uh, briefly, uh, Chamber Customs not only will deliver uh, for you in terms of making your customs declarations through any uh, uh, inventory link port or non-inventory link port in the UK, we also provide advisory services and we train people. Um, our training has been uh, very, very busy these last few months and in fact all of our courses up to the year end are pretty much full. I think we have one uh, space left on a, a course that takes place in a week or so for, um, for customs intermediaries. Um, Advisory services, we're doing a lot in terms of helping businesses to understand impact and options for themselves. Um, 
quite highlight there on what we offer. I've talked about the 200 agents across the UK, um, the 45 locations. We're trusted, we're adaptable, we'll deliver, and we'll offer very clear pricing and line by line invoicing uh, for you. Um, just briefly, there's a glossary of terms. There's a lot of uh, 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 shorthand used in, in the customs arena, which can be confusing for people. So there's a short glossary there to help you. Um, if you want to get ready and you want to uh, uh, engage Chamber Customs, complete this form or send us an email with that information on it, and we'll get an agent to contact you in order that we can set up your account. Thank you very much for your time, your attention. I think we're just about to go uh, um, to, to black for a period of time, and we'll come back and answer your questions shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. I think we've got two minutes until we go to the silence. Um, just if, if obviously, I understand people may need to leave you to go, but Liam will be here until half past 11 to answer any questions individually. I've been picking up quite a few as we go through. Um, the more general ones we will give to Liam, and any more specific ones we'll endeavour to answer by the team at a later time. That, that's fine. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll just come to one before we we, we, we close down. Uh, like graphics marketing, if we're using a freight forwarder that will be responsible for filling out our customs declarations, can we assume that we do not need a duty deferment account as it will be them who are deferring the duty? It will be they who are deferring the duty, but they can uh, they, they typically would expect you to pay the duty up front. Um, uh, they would be unlikely that we give you credit terms on that. And typically they would also charge you a handling fee uh, for using their deferment account. You can take a, those costs out of the transaction by applying for your own duty deferment and having them appoint your deferment account for the duty. That will save you some money. We'll come to the rest later. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everybody. Liam, do you want to come back on screen? You should have me back now. Yeah, got you. Okay, um, I've, I've picked out some more general questions. Obviously, there are lots of specific questions in there that are, 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 are very um, detailed, so I'll leave you to answer those um, separately. Yeah. Um, I've got one from Callum Howie. What do you expect trade issues? Ex when do you expect trade issues? Um, experience from the 1st January to begin to ease and when do you think the new normal for trade will settle? That's a, it's, it's a really good question and I wish I had a crystal ball. I, I guess um, 
what, what what I would say is that I would look to the you know best worst case scenario that that the the government uh, analysis that's the best analysis we have and and and, and that shows that the the expectation is that traders and truckers will not be uh, ready um, that there are uh, uh, facilities being set up to be able to stack trucks as as people will have read and uh, Marston Airport and various other locations but. Um, I, I think it's going to take some time, e even with staged uh, um, uh, declarations. I think it, it's clearly going to take some time to be able to uh, um, uh, get businesses up to speed with all that they need to do, to get intermediaries up to speed with all they need to do. And the only way to ease the pressure at the ports will be for uh, both sides to reach an agreement to focus and, and to um, allow trade to flow um, at the cost of, um, uh, you know, collecting or doing checks um, at the time. Now, nobody wants to say that our borders ought to be open because they'd be open to the nefarious as well as those that were carrying out legitimate business. But, you know, government knows that those that are uh, have a tendency towards compliance will, you know, ordinarily businesses will want to do the right thing uh, by and large will need to because the records they have to keep and so whilst there may be a, de a delay in the government collecting duties or VAT and they've already introduced measures to make that happen um, uh, ultimately uh, those 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 duties and, and taxes would be for the most recovered so we, we would ask them to focus on trade flowing uh, rather than stopping and checking uh, <clears throat> where um, the risks are, are relatively low but I imagine it's going to continue for some time. Okay. Um, and here's one from Jerry Martin. How can I identify a customs agent suitable to my business size and requirements? And how do I know the company's costs are reasonable and competitive? Yeah, that, 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 that is a perfectly reasonable thing to ask because we, we have heard um, from uh, around our members, around the network and from our colleagues, that there's a wide variety of pricing being quoted. So you either have a intermediaries low-balling on price and saying we do it for Ten pounds or twenty pounds or something, and and then the levy um, additional charges on top um, uh, that basically ra raise the price. Or uh, and we've also heard at the other end where uh, intermediaries are saying to take an additional customer on, then you have to pay substantially more because you're delivering low volume. Um, so so that, that that's the nature of demand supply marketplace, I guess, is that the the prices uh, may uh, rise uh, across the market in some places where uh, uh, you know supply lines are limited. Um, all I can say about our own business is that Chamber Customs has clear pricing. We, we don't pitch to be the lowest price, we pitch to be the right price and do it right. And um, so an import for a declaration for us is £55 and exports £25. Uh, if, you, if you use our deferment account, it's a 3% levy on the value of deferment, but we would prefer you had your own deferment account and your own VAT arrangements and, and, and don't pay us. Um, and if we are charged by the port for elements that we can't predict in advance, for example, uh, inspection by trade and standards or customs or border control uh, patrol uh, or whoever uh, does uh, any inspections and the port pays charges, then uh, if the charge is 90 pounds for a VAT inspection, we'll charge you 99 pounds. We won't double it. We'll just charge you ten percent of all uh, for handling the billing from the port and paying the port on your behalf. Um, so we, we just have clear and unambiguous pricing. Others may also have uh, some are less so. So um, I think you you have to just uh, make some inquiries. I'd say your priority should be to establish someone that can do the work for you um, uh, uh, at this stage, and then uh, work out a better price later. And ask your local chamber office for of course. advice. You know, we, we, we ask your local chamber. We have capacity still, but it is limited. And, you know, we, we have put on the market half a million declarations from the 1st of January, and that's being soaked up right now. And I don't say that to scare people or to say we're better than anyone else. I'm just saying that that's our position. Um, and I, I know that we will fill that capacity going where we are right now. OK, thank you. Um, Susanna Cordoba has a question. Um, she has, says we've got a number of members asking us about the rules of origin after the 1st of January. Where can companies find guidance on this and specifically about the EU in the event of leaving without a deal? 
Yeah, uh, thank you. Susanna is one of our colleagues uh, in the Chamber Network up there in Greater Manchester. Uh, Susanna, we, we are pressing government. It's uh, down to DIT and HMRC when they provide that guidance in gov.uk. And uh, clearly they want to uh, await the outcome of the deal. I should reassure people, though, that chambers around the country are very ready to deal with uh, certificates of origin for whatever market requires either a preference certificate or a non-preference certificate of origin. Uh, we have the UK certificates printed and in stock at Chambers, and we will shortly have the uh, um, preference certificates from HMRC, which will still be called an EUR1, but there will be a UK EUR1, uh, and the, all of the stamping and, uh, and, and system changes have been done, and we are ready. We just need the signal from government of uh, uh, our ability to use uh, those new certificates and for the gov.uk uh, website and <coughs> to, to, to have that information. I should mention that they will also be writing to the uh, embassies of foreign governments and through our uh, embassies overseas uh, to customs authorities and the like, uh, um, indicating uh, um, the change that's taking place and, and how we'll be dealing with that. And we will also be circulating through the International Chamber Network and the Certificate of Origin Council to ensure that chambers and customs authorities around the globe um, uh, have the information they need to clear your goods. Okay, thank you. Can we move on to um, a few more technical questions? Are you up for those? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll answer if I can. There are so many questions, I've just lost all my hags, it's all shifted up the screen. Let's go for this one. Um, from Ashley Vickers from Pulsar Measurement. Where can I find use of the preference rules for the FTA that are already that have already been agreed with other countries? Well, here's, here's the thing, actually. So the, the, the countries have uh, reached agreement. Um, uh, at some of those arrangements have, have not yet gone through Parliament. Uh, but I think it's... A, 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 um, a, and, and, and also in terms of the uh, tariff, uh, the trade tariff, some of that detail is not yet contained within Volume 2 of the trade tariff. Um, so um, given the GSP, announcement yesterday, we'd expect that to be updated. It is a huge frustration for intermediaries and for traders that they cannot go to the tariff and get all of the information that they currently need. And the tariff will be dynamic, I think, uh, as, as we go through the, uh, the next few years and reach new trade agreements. But, but it's a fair point that actually raises. We need that information. Businesses need it now. They have either existing contracts or are seeking to sign new contracts with customers, but there's an absence of information. This is one of the big chunks of data that, that, that traders need and we don't yet have. Um, so um, keep your eye on gov.uk. Um, as they publish more data, we always highlight it, um, but, but, but actually um, I would bookmark uh, uh, the, the uh, tariff volumes uh, for uh, Chief and CDS, uh, which are on gov.uk. Uh, in particular around those countries that matter to your business. Okay, thank you. A question from Natasha Lay. Does Chamber Customs have customs agents who can handle excise goods in tank containers? Uh, we, 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 don't, uh, um, uh, we, we don't handle excise goods at all at this point in time. So we've made our focus uh, at, at the moment on non-excise goods. And uh, although we do handle uh, control goods, but uh, uh, tanked um, excise goods, uh, uh, alcohol and the like. No, currently uh, we are not handling uh, uh, goods going into customs warehouses. Okay, and um, from Mr Anonymous, attendee, do you expect the level of certificates to, of origin to increase or decrease? Uh, I expect them to be, uh, our analysis suggests they'll be broadly similar. That's to say that those countries that are on my list where we currently have preference and will not have preference, if you take those countries out of preference and you add in those countries that, that um, require non-preference documents, then it's about the same. They're no more, no less at this stage. Um, you know, if you take the EU, I think someone asked about will they require certificates of origin for EU countries, and they're uh, un unlikely to be required uh, for, for EU countries, but it depends on the terms of the deal. There have been some deals where a dual system has been offered where you can have self-declaration and invoice or use a certificate of origin as, as, as people know it. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it depends on the country and it depends on the nature of the agreement. But we think that broadly at the moment with what we know, it's, it's about um, uh, even in terms of volume. If anything, it may be slightly fewer 
uh, certificates required by businesses uh, rather than more. And a question from Rizvan, which is very specific, but I think can probably be adapted to a lot, a lot of people here. Um, they send fresh lamb carcasses dispatching early in the morning at 5 a.m. on a Saturday, and on Saturday, sorry, and they won't know the final weight until dispatch. Will Chamber Customs operate at such early times? Um, well, well, actually, the the uh, the weight of uh, I mean, the, the thing about that uh, that pre that that declaration would need to be pre lodged in any case, um, and so there is there are time limits uh, um, uh, by which you would have to have pre lodged a declaration uh, depending on where you're going, what the routing is, and so on. And again, that information is available on on gov.uk. So uh, Chamber Customs will be able to operate for most businesses at the times they require. Um, if, if we can't deliver for you, we'll tell you we can't and we'll send you somewhere else. Um, we don't offer a 24 hour service, seven days a week. Um, and, uh, and frankly, neither does anyone else that I'm aware of, very few do, unless you're talking about DHL, uh, DPD and, and others who operate in other parts of the world outside of UK time. Um, so we, we are, we're operating within the UK uh, we won't meet everyone's needs, we know that, uh, but uh, we will meet the needs of, of, of a number of people. And it may be in circumstances where you're dispatching at 5 a.m. Um, from a location where you don't expect to load onto a vessel until maybe uh, seven or eight hours later uh, that you have that 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 time and, and we're not for you. Um, a question from Stuart Miller. Of the Chamber Customs locations, which the Scottish ones? So where will you be able to find that list? Um, so it, it, it's uh, um, it's on. Uh, uh, we we have that on our website actually. I think or maybe we don't. Maybe we don't. But we in, in Scottish terms we've got uh, uh, Inverness, Aberdeen, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Renfrewshire, Ayrshire, and Edinburgh. Did I say Edinburgh? Um, so there there are a, a number of locations across Scotland that can uh, that can deal with declarations in Scotland. But remember that actually. Um, if uh, imagine they were full to capacity, well, we have resilience across the network uh, to, to jump in and help if, if required as well. Uh, but we do have capacity in Scotland. So if you're in Scotland, then contact uh, Chamber Customs or directly to one of those Chambers of Commerce and they'll be able to help you. Okay, thank you. Um, Sam Webb asks if, he, if they are right to assume that borders at airports will be the same as those at ports. You're right to assume that, absolutely. Um, uh, no different, um, you know, border's a border. Um, the, the, at airports, though, there, the, 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 uh, the, there are, there tends to be um, a, a bit more, uh, a, a number of more actors involved in, uh, in, in moving goods between uh, uh, arrival and, and the air side and so on. So you, you, <clears throat> you may need to uh, uh, deal with cargo handling there as well in a way that's slightly different from, um, from seaports. Okay, um, one from Light Graphics Marketing. If we are using a freight forwarder that will be responsible for filling out our customs declarations, can we assume that we do not need a duty deferment account as it will be them who are deferring the duty? Yeah, that, that, that was one I, I, I did just before we, we went to the two minute silence. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah. But, I, but, I, but I was concentrating on making sure my clock was right. Absolutely. So j just, just to, uh, you know, it, it's, yeah, the freight forwarder can do it. They will charge you for the service. Um, alternatively, um, uh, you could uh, you, you can get your own duty deferment and postpone that accounting in place uh, and save some money in the transaction cost. So both options are available. Forwarders will do it um, uh, for you if that's the best uh, thing for you. Um, can I go to a couple on the same issue? Uh, uh, um, we've got someone asking, anonymous, saying, uh, do, you, do you know how long postponed VAT accounting will be in place um, uh, as an easement for six months. No, it's a forever. Um, we don't expect it to disappear. It's the, the way that all other VAT is dealt with and, and, and it is uh, for as long as uh, it needs to be in place unless something else comes along. Um, uh, and, and also, uh, how, do you, how do you set it up? Ask Susan. Well, you go to gov.uk uh, or Google postponed VAT accounting. Google's better than the gov.uk search engine. Um, find the HMRC section and it will describe there what you need to do in terms of managing your own records for postponed VAT accounting. It's not complex for anyone dealing with VAT. There'll be some familiarity um, uh, with most of the arrangements that they need to do. I have a slightly different question from Emma Lynch. Um, we've talked about companies that are importing and exporting goods. 
but what do businesses that supply services to you need to do to prepare? Yep, very good question. There is a huge focus on goods because that's what snarls up our ports, uh, but it's, a, uh, uh, it's, it's pertinent to ask uh, about uh, those uh, that, that are delivering services. Well, I actually, um, uh, you know, in terms of preparations, uh, I would be looking to uh, my delivery contracts and what those say. Um, if you're ever sending, even those that deliver services, often send uh, someone with equipment uh, overseas to implement uh, service contracts uh, or move data between, uh, between uh, locations. Um, uh, and so I would be looking, if I were you, to uh, the arrangements in terms of, of the services specific uh, to your business. I dealt with a client just uh, uh, in the last week or so um, who um, installs, um, they do install goods, they install uh, uh, um, systems into uh, places of work. Uh, but once they've done that part, then they have a service division that, that sends someone, any vehicle to locations for repair and maintenance. And uh, their question was, do I have to export the contents of the vehicle and uh, every time I send someone to do a repair or do some maintenance work? And the answer is, yeah, you do. Uh, if you're moving them into the EU, um, uh, uh, I, regardless of whether we have a deal or no deal, uh, there may be arrangements you need to come to with in, in terms of changing the whole way that you work. It may be that you have to locate um, a toolbox or uh, equipment in, in the other country and just send the person. Um, uh, so th there's a lot to think about where services and service uh, maintenance contracts are in place. Um, and it will be specific to your business. Uh, uh, you know, it will be different for somebody that's simply supplying software as a service to someone that's, that's uh, providing some kind of maintenance services um, uh, 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 that, that involves moving tools and people. A similar question from Susan McIntosh, who's from the Edinburgh International Festival. Um, she brings artists and support staff from the EU on short-term contracts every year. What additional measures will, we, will she need to take to ensure they can continue to do this smoothly? Well, of course, that, that will depend on uh, what arrangements we come to with the EU about the movement of people um, and, and whether the, uh, that that we were set out under a no-deal uh, uh, scenario would, would apply. So it may be that, that some of those artists would need to um, uh, you know, have uh, short-term work visas uh, to come to uh, perform uh, their uh, art in, uh, at the festival. Uh, but also, if they're bringing uh, equipment, then it may be that they, that they either import that equipment and re-export it, or they bring it into the UK using the system of ATA Carnet, uh, where the, the goods are um, brought in and returned as, as they are. Um, uh, uh, many companies use this for, I mean, broadcast industry uses ATA carnets uh, routinely. Uh, so too do people sending samples for exhibitions and the like. So that, that may be the best solution if the, if the artist also is bringing equipment and goods with them to uh, use a system of ATA carnet. You, okay, your Lee, local, uh, the Edinburgh Chamber can definitely uh, uh, assist you with uh, all, of those, uh, all of those questions. I'd encourage you to make contact with them. Liz has got a great team there in Edinburgh, hasn't she? She has. We've got about 10 minutes left, Liam. Do you want to pick out any questions that I might have missed that you think should be? Yeah, I, I have uh, highlighted a few. Of course, there are many more coming in, so I need mm -hmm. to to find those, Sarah. Um, it's difficult, isn't it? They're coming through so quickly. They, they keep moving on the stream. It is. I'm not quite sure how many we we, we have in so far. Uh, here, here we... Uh, you know, we, we've done that one. That's BCC. That's not me saying that. Here we go. Um, uh, Adam Stevens asks, would it be possible for HMRC to ease the requirements for a bank guarantee in relation to duty deferment accounts? Guarantees are costly and impact cash flow in an already difficult trading period, especially for businesses with less than three years trading. So what Adam's referring to here is that um, uh, under the previous system of uh, customs comprehensive guarantee, a business would need to either uh, put up cash in the form of a bank bond or uh, buy an insurance premium bond, uh, that, uh, an insurance premium in the form of a bond that guaranteed that if the business failed to pay the duty and VAT, that the bond or the cash guarantee would cover the amounts outstanding, the, the customs debt in effect. More recently, um, the removal of the customs comprehensive guarantee requirement uh, sets a limit of uh, £10,000 per month for traders of good standing and with uh, three years trading uh, in the UK. However, there is a, 
uh, an exception to the three year trading within the, the application process, Adam. So a, a business can uh, provide, uh, make application with less than three years trading, as long as it can provide sometimes an intercompany guarantee or demonstrate the viability of their business with less than three years trading to be able to meet the, uh, the customs debt. And that may be in the form of you know, cash that you hold or reserves that you retain or the, the prospects for your business. So I would urge all businesses to make application uh, uh, to, to, uh, in, in that regard. There is some flexibility that HMRC have retained. Clearly the one that will not be uh, flexible is if a business is not of good standing and has been in breach of HMRC uh, 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 customs rules uh, in, the, in the recent past uh, within the last three years, that would be much more difficult. But there, there is flexibility, and I know that colleagues in HMRC are very keen to ensure that businesses can benefit from this guarantee-free scheme uh, um, uh, in, in, in that. So hopefully that answers that for you, Adam. Um, uh, P. Elliott uh, also asked, is there a value or weighted threshold and when a business-to-business -business shipment, i.e. a parcel, is, is exempt from full export declaration admin requirements? Are, are, are all transactions regardless of weight and value required to full declarations? There is a, a limit. The de minimis level is, uh, unfortunately, it's only £135 uh, um, is, is the limit. So if, if you were sending small components or parts that had a value of less than £135, then they're below de minimis threshold. You, you record that in the, uh, in, in the, with the fast parcel operator that you're sending the package with, and, and then you would be exempt from making any uh, any customs declarations above that, then you need to make those declarations. And those parcel operators have systems that extract the information from you in order that they can make that declaration on your behalf. Um, I think there okay, was we've got time for one last question, I think, and before we need to wrap up. Okay. Um, I, I'm just trying to find one that I can uh, answer succinctly uh, uh, for you. Uh, if there is a free trade deal with uh, so anonymous attendee says, if there is a free trade deal, I presume with the EU, will customs declarations still be absolutely necessary, given that our interest rate submissions provide details of EC imports and exports? Well, actually, the answer to that is very simple. Yes, they will be. Um, uh, interest rate submissions are only going to apply for a period of, uh, as I understand it, six months from January uh, next year. Uh, for the period when staged uh, 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 import declarations from the EC can still apply. Um, beyond that time, it, it may actually be longer than like maybe next calendar year, uh, but interest that data uh, and submissions will cease to exist in the current form after that time. And actually the rules-based system of trade uh, dictates that if you are a third country to a trade block, unless we're part of a trade block that's agreed to uh, be a single customs territory, then customs declarations must be made. And so there's no avoiding them. They have to be done. The only thing that would stop them being required with the EU would be if we were to decide uh, to be part of the single European market once again. And the chance of that happening, I think, is a big fat zero. So uh, they will be required. You need to find a, a, an, inter an intermediary to make those for you. Uh, they are unavoidable and they will be, of course, additional cost to business that will, I'm sure, uh, probably have to flow down uh, to customers and impact in consumer prices in some way, shape or form. But that's as much as I can give you assurance they will be required. They will have to be done on that. OK, thank you, Liam. Um, as always, your encyclopedic knowledge <laughs> of all things trade, trade and customs is, is very impressive. Um, I, I will wrap up there. Thank you. We've had just over 200 questions. Those of us we haven't been able to answer, we will take some to government and find the answer and feed feedback to you. Or the ones we can answer directly, we will do that as much as possible in the follow up. Um, we also, um, you'll be able to get recordings of this from your local chamber. Um, our next customs event will be on the 1st of December, 10 to 11.30. So keep an eye out for that if you um, want to join us then. But I'll just close by saying thank you to everyone for joining us and for your time and thank you Liam for your expertise and to all for joining us earlier on. Uh, uh, thank you very much to, to everyone. Um, can I say one final thing which is it's, I've just uh, uh, thought about this. Uh, there is a stakeholder email address HMRC where they will take specific questions and respond directly to you. 
we will include that address in the uh, the email that we send to you after this call, along with the presentation content. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much, everybody.